Imagine this, you've just wandered into a brand new restaurant attracted by its addictive aroma wafting through the neighborhood. With $10 to your name, you're ready to spend it on a feast you won't forget. But upon discovering the diner offers four scrumptious choices, you just can't decide on what to order. Wouldn't it be nice if you knew what decision would make you the happiest person beforehand? Wouldn't it be nice if you knew how to calculate happiness? Well, you can, but to understand happiness, we need to start at its source, money. Back in 1713, a man named Nicholas Bernoulli proposed a mind-bending paradox involving a simple coin toss game. In this game, you start with one dollar. Every time the coin lands on heads, your prize doubles. But the moment it lands on tails, the game ends and you walk away with whatever you've earned. Now, here's the paradox. If you calculate the expected value of the game, you get an infinite value. Essentially, according to math, the game should be worth infinite money. But in reality, most people don't even make it to $4. This disconnect puzzled mathematicians for centuries, until this fellow called Gabriel Kramer proposed that not all dollars are worth the same. To a rich man, $100 would be worth significantly less than it is to a poor man. In mathematical terms, the happiness gained, or utility from money, does not increase linearly. It slows down and grows more like the square root of your wealth. That simple shift turns the infinite expected value into something finite. And suddenly, the paradox makes sense. We've just shown through this paradox that it is possible to approximate happiness. So can we extend this and apply the theory to the diner? You're armed with just $10 and want to extract the maximum happiness from your meal. You have got four choices. A burger for $1.05. A bundle meal for $4.10. For some reason, sulfuric acid for one cent. And finally, fries for 50 cents. Evidently, this is more complicated than Kramer's situation. Our decision making comes with the added constraints of limited cash and multiple options. As such, we need to figure out two things this time. The first being what we can buy. To determine what's within our budget range when dealing with four options is a real mind bender, but starting with two is much easier. For now, only consider burgers and fries. Because we have two variables, it's perfect for graphing on a Cartesian plane. If you were a huge fan of burgers, you could get 9. If you're weird and only wanted fries, you could afford 20. Now, we can work our way across the x-axis. I want one fry and all the rest are burgers, now I want two fries and all the rest are burgers, you see where I'm going with this. At the end, we get this cool little plot that's often called the Production Possibilities Frontier. At high enough values, it starts to resemble a curve, or a line in this case. Nice, but our goal is to determine which of these possibilities in the frontier is the best choice. To do this, we need to take a page out of Kram's book and design a utility function. This one would not take in money, but rather our selection of food. By performing some calculations, it will output the amount of happiness points we get from consuming it. Then we can compare two numbers and see which one is bigger. For example, if this apple has one utility point and this banana has two, you would obviously want the banana more than the apple. To design a good function though, we need to understand human behavior in what's fittingly called behavioral economics. As discussed earlier, utility is not linear. Generally speaking, each additional unit of product gives less happiness, known by economists as the law of diminishing marginal utility. Keep in mind that diminishing marginal utility can result in happiness declining after a certain point, making further consumption of goods actually subtract from your happiness. This could be the case when you get so full that you don't want to eat anymore. Another thing to consider is that humans want to try a little bit of everything. This is known as the preference for diversification. Bananas may be your favorite fruit, but chances are you don't want to only eat bananas. I mean, it would make you bananas. All right, good stuff. The two things to implement in our function are diminishing returns and a preference for diversification. 
To fit the first condition, we can use any function that has a decreasing rate of change. Cramer liked the square root, but considering how quickly people get full, it might make more sense to employ a logarithm. If you're unfamiliar with logarithms, it's okay. Just know that they are a type of function that really, really diminishes that happiness. Of course, not everyone experiences happiness the same way. You could not be hungry, but suddenly build up a massive appetite and suddenly throw up and die. Our model only approximates, it does not measure. Nonetheless, we can use logarithms to get this pretty neat utility function. It's fine if you don't understand logarithms, but in this case, the base 2 is for simplicity, the plus 1 is to ensure 0 burgers return 0 happiness, and the 100 coefficient sets the scale so that the first burger is worth 100 happiness points. With this function, the first burger is 100 points. But to get 200, you need 3 burgers, and to get 300, you need a whole 7 burgers. For the fries, we can use the same function, but change the 100 to something like 80, as burgers are generally more appetizing than fries. Perfect, one down. Now we just need to fit the second criteria of diversification. Let fries be x and burgers be y. The final utility function would be some function of xy, such that balancing these two gives the highest output. One way we could do this is just by adding our two logarithms together to get this cool looking 3D graph. The reason this function would give higher outputs when x and y are roughly balanced is because overcommitting on either variable would result in diminishing happiness, when adding both can somewhat mitigate this. So this is the current utility function. This use of logarithms added together is called the logarithmic form of the Cobb-Douglas utility function. Quite a mouthful. Great, we're done, right? We can finally input our selections and see what to order. Well, no, we're forgetting a crucial detail. We've only considered two of four choices, a simplification made earlier to better explain production possibility frontiers. But our diner offers four delicious choices, and by only considering two, we have quite literally halved the menu. So how can we fix this? How can we account for the other two options? Well, easy, just add two more expressions to represent the bundle meal and the literal sulfuric acid. For the bundle meal, it would provide more happiness than a single burger or fries, so let's say it has a coefficient of 200. The sulfuric acid, on the other hand, would taste as bad as my cooking and actively harm you in a way that does not diminish marginally. So we could just subtract the number of sulfuric acids multiplied by something like 400 for extra influence. Now for the complicated part. What would the new production possibility frontier be? With four variables, its points would resemble a 3D object living in four-dimensional space. Yeah, we don't really solve it this way, and trust me, the mathematics of Lagrange multipliers is way beyond this video. But we have already set up our problem. The information is there, and we can finally use it to make our decision. With $10 in our explanation of happiness, you now know that you should order 3 burgers, 5 fries, 1 bundle meal, and sadly, no sulfuric acids, totaling an approximate 606.8 utility points. Chow down on the food, be happy, and thanks for watching.